Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another sunrise safari being opened beautifully by an African hoopoe in the road looking for little arthropods hopping around after all the rain we've had over the last couple of days. I'm probing away with that beak and you can see that erectile crest of his. <laughs> Always nice to start the morning with something a little smaller. And what a lovely morning it is. My name is Ben, camera I have got Odie with me again and we are out on the rooster. And yeah, we're just enjoying a nice gentle start to the morning on quarantine. You can see we've got some blue sky, some intermittent clouds. It is forecast to be quite humid again today, I think. Uh, but it's actually a very pleasant start to the morning. And yeah, we're just doing a little bit of birding uh, up on quarantine. Obviously, my plan for the morning is to head down to follow up on Mr. Fluffy Ears himself, Mr. Marips, and see uh, whether he is still with his multiple... Uh, Dacre kills that he had last night. I think the hoopoe flew away, uh, but I've just noticed there's a roller over there. We can maybe go to the roller and that dead tree over there on the left hand branch. But I hope wherever you are joining us from, you are safe and well this morning. And of course, this is a live and interactive safari as always. So we would love to hear your questions, your comments, and all of the above. Hasina, I'm glad you're hoping to see lots of birds, uh, and I'm glad to oblige. And a very good morning to you too. But yes, I'm expecting a good birding morning, especially if it stays a little bit sunny this morning. Um, so there are a lot of insects around. Last night when we were driving back after leaving Marips, we were inundated by another emergence of, I think we had a harvest of termites coming out last night. They were everywhere. With the headlights on, it was like driving through a blizzard. Uh, we had to drive back basically with the lights off. Uh, and then randomly, they just suddenly disappeared. We obviously, we just went through the end of that emergence. Uh, but when we got back at camp, we had an amazing sighting of a centipede, which is a little predator we have out here, uh, chomping on these little termites. And I saw a type of hunting behavior I've never seen before from centipedes. So the centipede, whilst he was eating termites, if any other termites came too close to his legs, <coughs> excuse me, uh, too close to his legs, he'd catch the termites with his legs and sort of keep them in a cage on, on, on his underside with his legs wrapped around them. And as soon as he'd finished feeding on the previous um, termite, he would just sort of pass it up his legs, almost like a conveyor belt into his mouth. Uh, I've never known centipedes to do that, but it was a bounty for him yesterday. And there we go, we've got a lovely crested barbet as well. Yeah, with a funky haircut, looks like a giraffe. It's got some ossicones. A nice slow start to the morning. Well, I am not the only feed out this morning. Um, we also have Chris over in Prideland, so let's send you over to him to say hi. Well, it does seem like we're opening today with a variety of birds. I believe Ben has a few. I just couldn't resist to start off here at Nglovu Dam. We've made our way early to catch, not the sunrise, but the first rays of light on the little goslings. And it's just such an endearing sight in order to, to watch them. My name is Chris, and with me on Camops is Yuan Stol. Johan Reineke and our plan today, while we are looking at the goslings, is just to go and look for tracks. Why do I say that? We again had some rain last night, not nearly as much as the day before, but it was a nice quick sort of thunderstorm that we had. So there will be new tracks, the soil is still rather damp, so it might just enable us to find tracks and I am going to say it I think we should try and target some cats for what it's worth I just love the way that the two parents are swimming with the goslings 
And again, I prefer ducklings. Good morning, Jim. Jim also said that he's ready with his coffee and his eagle eyes. Well, Jim, welcome aboard. And uh, though I don't have a coffee currently in my hand, as soon as this segment's done, I'm definitely going to make myself another cup. So Jan and I packed ourselves a nice coffee box this morning on this catter day. <laughs> Jan actually brought us a hazelnut coffee, which is quite um, an interesting coffee. A hazelnut infused coffee. So I'm keen to try that. And here's some guinea fowl going off. Right. Well, I think I'm going to go and explore. Well, first make a coffee and then go and explore whether there's any tracks around after the rain. So let's go over to Taylor now to say good morning. Now, it might be quite difficult to see what we're looking at this morning, but if you peer very closely through the grass, you'll see an African land snail that's just kind of creeping along. But we are going to actually have to reposition for the snail. Can you believe it? It moved so quickly that it moved off of the road and into a place where we now can't see it. Typical. That's normally how things go for me. But anyways, my name is Taylor McCurdy and on camera with me today is Igor and we are of course bumbling around Juma hoping to find all sorts of weird and wonderful things. I don't have too much of a plan this morning. Um, probably have another little look at the snail and then I think we will carry on and look for bugs, maybe some elephants and anything else that really uh, pops out. So, We'll see. We shall see. Let me just see. You got, I actually don't know how you're going to film it from this side because I'm, it might require me to... You've got... Okay, Ego. 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 I'm going to call you Ego now because of that comment. <laughs> ego. Okay. Oh, look here. Look at that view. That's not too terrible, I don't think. So we're just going to... You know how it goes. Set the camera, get it ready for this exhilarating seen on an African land snail. Hope you're all bracing yourselves for this excitement. Look at it go. It's quite a big one actually. It's really enormous. Just going about its day. It's got lovely coloration on it. Look at that. I was hoping we we're gonna find one feeding on a large mushroom of sorts but that's not the case today. But of course as you, I'm sure you all know that these snails will pretty much eat anything of the veg vegetarian kind. Okay. Quite awesome. We've also of course been listening out for any alarm calls and those types of things but it's been fairly quiet other than the birds singing their beautiful songs. Hey snail, you're gonna go off and maybe lay some eggs? Perhaps that'll, that'll what it'll do, make lots more African land snails? It's actually quite difficult to spot them in the summer months unless they are out in the road but I'm sure there are plenty of them. I couldn't even begin to tell you how many African land snails I think are just on Juma, but I'm sure it is a lot. But the grass conceals them quite nice. Or unless you find the little slimy um, residue that they leave down on the ground when they cross the road too, that's also a great way of pointing them out. Ah, oh, well, not surprised. It seems as though Ben has already completed his mission for this Saturday morning. It sounds like he has found a cat. Yes, thank you, Taylor, and welcome back. Uh, yes, Berips is still where we left him, pretty much. He's in the same tree that we had him in last night. His, or what's left of his diker kill is slung over a branch at the back. Uh, which we won't be able to show you at the moment. It's sort of where I've parked. We can't see uh, the dacre. And yes, the sun is very much rising just off sort of behind and to the left of him. So we're getting to get that beautiful little halo of light on his left-hand side of his head there. Look at that, and on his tail. 
But not a bad way to start a cat a day, I would say. He looks very, very comfortable up there. Oof. <laughs> what a glorious pose. Thank you, Marips, for still being here. quite sure what has attracted his attention. He's been looking over there, I wouldn't exactly say intently, but he keeps glancing in that direction. Uh, but there are some impalas milling around uh, towards the top of this road here towards quarantine, so maybe you just heard something moving through the bushes. But I was interested to see whether his uh, kill would still be here after we had those other alarm calls quite close last night in the area. I did wonder if Luati was around and uh, I've no doubt that Luati would have chased Marips off his kill if it was him, uh, but it seems not. But so we'll go and have a look at the uh, what's left of the Dacre in a minute and try and figure out how much he's had. But what a spectacular way to start the morning. I hope you're all appreciating this as much as I am. Uh, but we're going to sort of reposition, see if we can get the best angle here for everybody. <laughs> He's passed out again. Uh, try not to disturb Marips' slumber. I'll send you back across to Chris at his waterhole and see what he's found. As I was. Cats. From... And Glovy Dam, then Glovy's arrived. Remember, Glovy is the Zulu name for elephants. Look at that. I love the crisp light. As a photographer myself, this is a beautiful scene. That light is just amazing. And with elephants being very large, three dimensional creatures, a bit of side lighting always just brings out that three-dimensionality of them. And this is definitely the light for them. Soft, early morning light. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Absolutely stunning. Look at that little one. Now something tells me if they are drinking this early, it's going to be a hot day. Another one. Not sure that's a good or a bad thing. I love it in the way they walk away from you. <laughs> Look at this one, one adult still drinking. Old cow, not an old cow, but a mature cow. And the rest are now slowly moving into that tree line. Good morning, Timothy. Timothy also just said good morning to the cat man. And it's nice to see a wet pridelands. It is indeed, Timothy. Um, I was starting to get a bit worried about the rain. We've had some good start rains, you know, early on in October, but it's been a bit dry, you know, and uh, it's amazing. And we'll show you as we drive along today how two days of rain have virtually transformed the landscape. 
instantly. And we've touched on that a bit yesterday. And you can see a little bit there where those elephants are moving. You can see that sort of new grass shoots coming out there. Literally in two days. Look at that green flush coming out there. comes mom and dad goose with the with the crew <laughs> so cute It's almost as if they're deliberately turning, showing them the ropes. Teaching them how to be geese. Very, very comfortable on his branch there. <laughs> and you might just notice there on the uh, left of your screen, there is what is left of his Dacre kill. Still looks to be a decent amount of uh, meat there, but it's fairly well wedged uh, over that little branch on the left. And of course, this is the modus operandi of leopards. Stash your kill in the tree. Keep it away from any marauding hyenas and hopefully lions. And then that will last him a couple of days potentially but i think by the end of today assuming he does feed sort of at a normal rate there's probably not going to be much left by tonight but i have no doubt he's not going to go very far today oh, where are you off to ribs I'll, I'll move in a minute his head's behind that other trunk of the marula i just want to see whether he's just going to reposition himself or maybe he's going to come in for a bit of breakfast. Look at that light now beginning to filter through the leaves. How stunning is that? Incredible balance, eh? So sure-footed. He's just standing up and having a little check of the lay of the land, perhaps. But I don't see any hyenas in the area. Often we would find a hyena potentially lying under a tree here where there is a kill, hoping that the leopard drops something. Uh, but no sign of any of the Juma clan here yet this morning. Yes, morning, Dark Bane Lover. Good to hear from you. And yes, what a cat a day. It is, Mr. Fluffy is, is very comfortable up here in his marula. If he keeps having a glance across at that dacre, I wonder if he's going to come and have a little bit of a nibble. Let's have a look. No, I think... No, we're just going to swap positions. Right, let's us move so we can get you a better view because he's sort of half behind the branch there. <laughs> We are utterly spoiled, are we not? Saturday morning, leopard in tree, African sunrise. Worst ways to start a cat a day. Right, Owen, tell me if you find a, a nice view, but I reckon if we just go past and look back up here, we should be okay. I reckon that's gonna work. That good for you? There we go. So 
So we are so lucky that, uh, well, A, that we see leopards so regularly, uh, and B, that we can uh, bring you these incredible images where these animals are so habituated to the vehicles. And so we're in that position to view natural wildlife at an unnaturally close proximity. It's very humbling. I consider ourselves very lucky, especially having worked in areas outside the Sabi Sands. Uh, I did a year in Tanzania where I did not see a single leopard. When I was working in Kozulu Natal, I think in a, a year or so down there, I think I maybe had like five leopard sightings. Uh, so those of you who've been watching the show for a, a while, um, but if you've never visited out here, if leopards are your thing, you need to come to the Sabi Sands. Cindy D, good morning. Uh, if I um, if I heard your comment correctly, did you say he's got a a food coma? Uh, if you didn't, I apologise. But if you did, I think that's a wonderful description. <laughs> now maybe you could just confirm the the comment again for me. A food coma, Cindy D. I think that's a, a very apt description this morning. I've just noticed we do have a hyena milling around. I thought we might do. It's over there, Eddie. It might be behind the trees for you, but there is a hyena just skulking through the grass. Let's see if we can get a view of uh, it for now. Moving off to the left, I think. There, backside of a hyena. Who have we got there? I know Gingrika popped in last night, but I think this one looks a little bit bigger than Gingrika. But maybe just meandering past on the off chance that seems to be disappearing stage left, I'm afraid. Doesn't look like uh, this hyena is going to hang around. And if Mribs, maybe that's what Mribs was looking at when we got here because so he was looking at something. Uh, if anyone's noticing that wire on the tree, it's just a little uh, project that we have here. Uh, in this area where we're trying to protect some of these larger, more established trees uh, from elephant damage. So we just put the wires around uh, the tree to stop them debarking them and pulling off that bark with the tusks. There is something about a leopard in a marula there. I think leopards were just designed for marulas and vice versa. Even monkeys don't look as comfortable as leopards can get in a marula. Those branches, those sort of geometrical shaped branches are just the perfect spot. You often see a marula trees here and you think, oh, that would be such a perfect leopard tree. And occasionally it works out that way. <laughs> he's got his two back legs slung over on the same side. Quite sure how he's resting up there. He's, he's, his bum pretty squarely wedged on that bottom branch. But however he's managed to manipulate his body up there, he does look very comfortable, we'll give him that. Okay, let's send you back over to Taylor. I think she's made her way down towards Treehouse Dam. Let's see how she's getting on that side. Um, that is a good plan, Ben. Um, so we, I'm sure you all know where we are, I don't even need to mention it, but for those of you that are unsure, we are sitting at Treehouse Dam, and it has been a very long time since I have been here. Oh, no, uh, sort of. Um, but there is a hippo in the water, and there is also another animal, but I don't think that any of you, or two animals, that you'll actually be able to see them, because they are fast asleep in the grass and now Igor's going to do the most dramatic slow zoom I'm trying to think what music would be appropriate um, as we did the slow zoom but I'm, my mind is not particularly clear at the moment but there we go, oh look a flick of the tail look at that action <laughs> we've got two big 
male lions sleeping and if you have been watching over the last couple of days you'll know that they are the black dam males i have never seen these lions before um, but Igor informed me that they come from thorny bush which is wonderful so that's quite a distance not really a distance away as a crow flies and i suppose if you sneak through all the game reserves it's uh it's not so much. Oh, Lions, have you actually just realized that we're here? Can you hear my booming voice by any chance? They look very unimpressed with us. Don't worry, Lions, if you don't want to be the stars of the show, we've got a hippo that's obliging. He's also s sleeping, but he flicks his ears. It's just as much action. We'll keep an eye on those Lions, that's for sure. Um, they, it sounds like they have just been sleeping after a big meal yesterday. And maybe they will have some energy and maybe get up and go for a little bit of a walk around which would be wonderful to see hey boys quite a few little birds as you can imagine always hanging around the dam we won't show you all of them but i'll just mention a few of course the 600 blacksmith lapwings that live at treehouse dam then there are lots of red bull buffalo weavers which you might be able to hear every now and then they of course make all the nests around around the dam and a couple of birchall starlings and then lots of other things talking in the background. These are beautiful lions though. They don't look particularly old. Has anybody guessed how old they are or said how old they are? I suppose they'll know. They were born in 2017. Yeah, no, you can definitely see that. And this one's got really good lion mane genetics. Hi Puma! Sure, goodness, I've been on all sorts of expeditions this year. I've seen many lions. Uh, uh, let me start with one of the places I went to. I actually was not too long ago in Ruaha National Park in Tanzania and that holds 10% of Africa's lion population. So you can imagine we had lions coming out of our ears. I was like, I've never been so excited in my entire life. Every corner you looked around there was a lion. Speaking of lions, they're going to get up and move. They might be moving to the shade because look at how full those bellies are. Or, it, they, you know, if they carry on going, that'll be great. We'll just wait for them to come out um, of the block. Are you going to oh, use, the, use the luxury facilities? That's wonderful. This is my favorite thing to see. Um, so, yeah, Puma was there. And then I was in, um, some of you might know the old name for this national park, also in Tanzania called uh, Salu Game Reserve, which is one of the oldest um, parks in in Africa, um, but the name has now changed to Nyerere a National Park. That was a lot of fun as well. Gosh, I've been to Tanzania a couple of times this year. I've been to the Ngorogoro Crater, I've been into the Serengeti, I've been to Arusha National Park, which was quite interesting, funny enough. Didn't see any lions though, uh, but very pretty, did a nice walk, the hiking is beautiful. Looked at uh, um, Mount Kenya and through my binoculars which was awesome because there was a little bit of snow yeah straight into the shade and straight down and I've never seen snow in real life so that's the second time I've seen snow with my binoculars look at me go and um, where else did I go while I was there oh Tarangiri was quite interesting that's also in in Tanzania then of course I've been to Kenya done you know the, the Mara the Reserve the Triangle and a couple of different conservancies which are really exciting I've been to Zambia my favorite place in the entire world but I'll tell you uh, a bit more about Zambia probably over the next couple of days on the 12 days of Christmas wild earth has planned to see 12 hippos hiding, 11 weavers weaving, 10 leopards leaping, 9 ostrich dancing, 8 liner lying, 7 ellie swimming, 6 cheetah chasing, 5 buffalo, 4 calling cubs, 3 giraffes, 2 crocodiles, and a naughty vervet monkey. Thank you. 
there they are. Not doing too much too. There was another vehicle that just very quickly popped in to the sighting. I think they're probably going to go around and try to get a bit closer. I'm happy to watch them from over here. They're not doing much. Um, so we'll just wait and see what they get up to. Plus, you know, if they do go flat again, then at least we've got all the other creatures at the dam. It's quite limiting if we go and view them that side. But look at how long Eagle's lens is and look what he can do with it. It's amazing. Um, yeah, so... I'm quite curious to see what happens with these lions because, I mean, as you all know, when the evokers first arrived in the Sabi Sand, they were just handed a wonderful territory. They didn't even have to fight for it. There was very little roaring or any kind of commotion at all because the Birminghams had moved further south to prime property around the, the Sand River. And I don't blame them. Um, you know, quite nice down there. Lots of buffalo. And I'm hoping that uh, these boys will put on a little bit of a show and kind of do a takeover that normally happens. I mean, I'm not saying that they must go out and and kill a whole bunch of other lions to be able to claim their, their territories, but it would be quite nice to have some roaring action and to get from the S8 male back and forth, you know, that kind of thing. Unfortunately, he doesn't quite have the upper hand uh, with these two young boys, but also the S8 male is a lot more experienced, so that can also play in his side. But hopefully the Talamati breakaways uh, will just keep their distance. Sorry, came drop video, and um, uh, yeah, and just keep out of these boys' way. We'll see. Very, very interesting times here for the lion dynamics, um, and I suppose it's long overdue. Um, you know, these kinds of things. It's funny how the Sabi Sand kind of works, though. Sometimes it happens really quickly. There's a lot of disruption amongst lions fairly frequently, or it goes for years and years without anything happening. Hmm. Ah, oh, Dark Mane lover. Also very sad that Dark Mane is no longer with us, but he did leave and ex uh, live an exceptional life, though. Um, uh, sure, what cats do I miss and want to see the most? Goodness. Uh, I really miss the Kuhumas, to be honest. Uh, that was one of my favorite prides of lions. I've got two two favorite prides. The southern pride, I actually don't think that they exist anymore. There might be maybe one lioness uh, left, but they uh, spend a lot more time around the Sabi River, around like Sabi Sabi, Kirkman, maybe not so much Kirkman's lion sands, that sort of, that sort of side, but um, I don't think that they're around anymore. And then of course the Kuhumas very quickly became my favorite pride of lions. So. I know that their pri the pride has obviously split quite a bit and they're not doing as well. But lions are tenacious and it doesn't matter how many curveballs are thrown at them, a lot of the time they're able to overcome all sorts of situations. So, yeah, who knows? Maybe them. Um, leopards are not my favorite right now, so I don't know who I'd like to see of them. Um, we'll, we'll just give it a couple of days and then I'll probably go looking for for some leopards and yeah of the big cats i don't know i'm a lion girl ali and i have always been lion girls and it was a we i think for the last couple of years we always have this argument especially with tristan where we try and convince him that lions are superior than leopards of course it's just a joke and it's not anything taken super seriously both cats are apex predators in their own right and and they are you know phenomenal but um yeah, I don't know. We'll see, but Dark Main Lover. We'll see what we see. I'm also, do you know what I'm really excited for, though? And it's, it hasn't got anything to do about lions, unfortunately. Sorry to disappoint most of you. <laughs> but you're all going to be so sick of me. Because I'm going to definitely do some bug searching and uh, see what other weird, wonderful things we can find. Well, our lions are not on the move, but it seems as though Marib's is starting to wake up. Oh, thank you, Taylor. Well, that works out perfectly. You're more of a lion girl. I'm more of a leopard guy. Uh, I would never will turn down the opportunity to come and watch something like this. I tell you, Marips has decided that a little bit of breakfast is at the order of the day. His head's now disappearing inside this, I'm sorry to say, long since disemboweled little grey dacre. But circle of life and all that.
day. He probably won't eat the skin, but for a small animal like this, even though leopards are not known for having incredibly powerful jaws, like something like a hyena, for example, um, a lot of the ribs and things in there will be eatable for him. Certainly he's got strong enough teeth to crunch through those uh, bones. Now, of course, that is an important source of calcium, and that marrow inside is very, very rich. You can see there he's sort of scissoring through the flesh there with those carnassial teeth at the back. So uh, the carnivora family, they don't really have molars like you and I do uh, for grinding food. Just like your cat at home, they sort of scissor off pieces of flesh and then swallow them whole. Uh, those teeth are almost sort of, I suppose, like little sort of triangular teeth at the back of the mouth. And every time they open and close, they self-sharpen each other against each other uh, and then they act almost like a pair of scissors so cutting through flesh and muscle and sinew you could often even hear it i doubt it'll translate through the microphone from this distance but you can hear that sort of <laughs> that uh, carnassial shear as it's called is at work And then we'll probably also see him doing a lot of licking as well. He will get a, a decent amount of moisture from the blood in this animal. Uh, but I'm sure he went for a drink at some point. Possibly there's a little puddle somewhere close by. Otherwise, Tumbetta House is not far from here. There's a little water hole in front of that camp. And so if you do see the, the leopards or lions licking at the kill, they're not just licking it out of some sort of... Uh, 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 what's the word I want? I can't think. We're not looking at for for fun. They've got that very very rough tongue, uh, which is able to actually strip bone, uh, strip bone, strip flesh away from bone. Feeding with a little bit more vigour now. Uh, don't forget, everybody, this is live and interactive. This is happening right now. Uh, and we would love to hear your questions regarding this or anything else out here that you've seen thus far this morning or you're hoping to see. And any of your comments, we love receiving them and uh, we'll happily answer them on the air and read them out. So we cannot do this without you guys, and this is why we do this uh, to know that. This leopard, along with our other ones seen regularly here, are so famous across the world. I doubt they understand just how much reach they have and what a, I don't want to say a fan base, I think that's the wrong impression to give, but how many people are invested in their lives and watch. Uh, if only we could explain how important they are and how highly thought of they are across the entire world interesting sort of way to think of it. I don't know exactly how many people are watching at the moment, but if this leopard is aware that he's being watched by hundreds of thousands, if not more people. Maybe that's why he's putting on such a show for us. The ultimate entertainer. <laughs> the Deku's nodding along. Leopard Lovo, uh, good morning. That's a good question, actually. I have never seen it, but I see no reason why they would not. Leopards are well known to eat pretty much everything and anything, um, and that's perfectly good protein in a snail. They're not uh, supremely toxic or anything like that, so I see no reason why they wouldn't. It's not something I've ever seen, uh, but I would think that would just be like you or I, say, grabbing, a, grabbing an apple or having a little biscuit. Uh, it wouldn't be much food, but protein is protein. I guess it's not really a fair fight for the snail. Uh, never seen it, but I don't see why not. I'm really splitting hairs now, but that second little small marula just to the right of the run that sort of was sort of impaling him, or it looks like. What a shame that's there from an aesthetic perspective. Sorry, I've got a sort of a bit of a background in wildlife photography, and that branch is. Uh, I'd say it's annoying me. 
but it would be a much cleaner image if it wasn't for that thinner trunk going up. Catterday indeed. Okay, so we've left in Glover Dam um, and we are now on route to well, the area around Leopard Dam. I want to go and see what's happening there and hopefully along the way find some cats or tracks of cats and uh, it is cat today after all. do so via Western Rocky Ridge, which we know is one of the preferred hangout spots for the Pixie Pan female. Days like this, I've often seen leopards in trees uh, because they particularly don't like wet on the ground and so often you'll find them in a, in a nice dry branch up in a tree. So one thing we can do is, especially the marulas, keep looking. Remember, they would have been quite cold during the night. They would have been rained upon. So with the first rays of sun coming out now, at, if I was a leopard, that's exactly where I'll be, up on a marula, waiting for the sun to heat me up a bit or to dry me out. Bumpy one. John, let's uh, see what the area around the Leopard Dam brings for us today. But I feel good. I feel like we're going to find some cats today. Cats. We've taken a little bit of a break from uh, from the lions because they kind of just moved into the shade behind some bushes. Even the other vehicle has gone, oh, don't want to watch sleeping lions, so they've moved off. But this is why we parked where we did, so we can diversify this morning. Um, so, we, of course, you're all so familiar with these birds, the blacksmith lapwing, but perhaps if you are a new viewer I'm just turning the game drive radio down I don't even know why I had it on but um, blacksmith lapwing is normally one of the first 10 birds that everybody sees when they, they come into the greater Kruger area and especially if you visit a watering hole here are definitely going to see them there's also a little terrapin swimming on in I don't know if you can see in between the two on the left you just see that little head going la 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 or I don't know, for those of you that follow the trends on what music is funny and what isn't. But of course they've just dipped themselves uh, in the water. They're actually quite submerged, which I was surprised by. These uh, these three birds are not afraid of water. It was just their little head sticking out, almost just like that terrapin. And um, they were just fluttering their wings and sort of shaking all the water all over their bodies and now of course they need to do the drying process and the preening cleaning of the feathers so they'll use the sun they'll ruffle their feathers they'll shake off the excess water and of course the the sun will help them dry but most birds um, as you all know or most of you all know have a preen gland which they will constantly keep uh, dabbing their beaks over it and then spreading that oily secretion across their feathers. So they'll be good for the day unless it gets a little bit hotter later which I suspect it's going to get. It feels like it's going to be quite warm today and they'll probably do the same thing again but maybe not necessarily to keep themselves clean but rather to cool themselves down. It's quite tough to be a bird 
when you need to cool yourself down. You know, they can't just pop the aircon on or, you know, go stand in a, um, a freezer, fridge, room type situation, which most lodges have. I used to, I was very guilty of doing that. I, some, on the hottest days, I'd need to look for something in there and I'd be in there for like 20 minutes at a time. It was quite nice. Anyways, the birds, of course, can't do that and uh, they need to rely on other ways to try and keep themselves cool. They can't pant either, like dogs. They do open their beaks quite a bit. Oh, sorry, Igor. Igor's scared to talk to me. <laughs> Are you scared to talk to me, Igor? Do I intimidate you? No, I just get in trouble for it. You get into trouble. Okay, sorry. Igor, he's allowed to tell me when something amazing is about to happen. And we don't know yet, but it could potentially, but there's a, you won't be able to see them because it's right behind the car. And I probably won't move now to, cause, to draw any attention to them, but there were a couple of zebra that actually popped um, from behind the vehicle. And they're just kind of going into the bushes. So what we are going to do is we are we're going to just watch very carefully to kind of see what happens because the zebra, I don't think the ri the the rions, I don't think the rions, the lions have figured out that they're there just yet. But these zebra are going to come down for a drink, and as soon as they do that, I think the bushes won't be in the way, and then the lions. Who knows? Even though they're, we know that they've eaten something recently, it doesn't mean that they're not going to catch something if there's an opportunity. It's a huge misconception. You see a fat predator and you go, oh no, they're not hungry, they won't eat. My goodness, they take any chance that they can get. Zebras? Is this the first time you've seen zebras? Wait, well, no, what did you say? No, since, I, since I got here, I haven't oh. seen them. Oh, the of goodness. Because apparently zebras are, are quite rare at the moment. Okay, well, we'll see. There's just the two of them. Oh, now, now you see, now they're making a mistake. Instead of coming down and drinking at the flattest part of Treehouse Dam, they're not. They're actually going to walk straight onto those lions. Let's see. A lion, one lion does have his head up. I can't see the other one because he's behind some bushes. Now you see this, the guy that was here before, he actually is left. And he would have been in prime position. There's a lot of cover there. So the lions have definitely got the upper hand. However, I think the wind is against the lions. Okay, look how they popped out. That lion has put its head down. It's moved slightly. Oh, they're going to run. Now you can see the zebra are not sure. I don't know if they can smell something. Probably because the lions would have come and had a drink yesterday. So their scent is going to be around. And the wind is not in their favor. But you can see that the zebra is very unsettled. Not 100% sure. And when zebra come down to drink at a water hole, it normally takes them ages because they are vulnerable. All animals that come down to drink are vulnerable because their heads are focused in one direction. Those lines are literally to the right of that zebra. You see that big bush? They're behind that bush there. I'm going to grab my binoculars. I don't know if I'm actually seeing one of the lions. No, it's just a changing color of the bush. So the zebra is also snorting. We're a bit far away to be able to hear that, unfortunately. But they're still in that dense vegetation. So what we will do, we're not going to go any closer, because the last thing that I want to do is influence the situation, whether it be in favor of the lions or in favor of the zebra. I'd rather just sit and wait and uh, see how it all pans out, but they are, they have turned around and they are moving out now. I don't think they're going to want to come and drink. Maybe they're going to come back around this side and try their luck. But I'm just keeping an eye out as well while you follow the zebra to just see if I can see any movement if the lions have perhaps got up and actually started following them. Or if they've just, those lions, okay, so the lions are up moving very slowly but it's you won't be able to see them do you see the silver cluster leaf that they're, they're just going past that to the left now i just saw some movement but very very slowly uh, a little bit to the right yeah i think where are you um i'm just trying to find there's that tree so kind of this tree here 
that they've just gone, but they're going to go past those trees, so they they might be following them. We'll just let them go up a bit further. But the zebra kind of haven't stopped there. I think they're moving out of it. I think they'll go find somewhere else to drink. Let's see if these lions pick up the pace a little bit. They might be able to keep up with the zebra, but otherwise, of course, they can continue tracking them because the zebras are going to lay a scent on the ground too. Now, I know this must, it can be quite frustrating when you can't see exactly what's going on. There they go. But it is super important to give the animals space and let everybody have a chance to get away. I think we as humans are too quick to move the cars around and there's noisy vehicles and we stall cars and we talk really loudly so I'm of the kind of person well, I'm definitely trying to change my ways to just give everything a little bit more space and we're so lucky to have these cameras that can zoom in which is really great I haven't seen the lions pop out yet though So I think, I think what we can do now is maybe just reverse and go back up to the road. Because I feel comfortable with those zebras now. They've moved away from the waterhole. We're not going to pin them in or anything. And we're literally just going to just go and have a look on the road and see if we can get a better view. And we'll wait there and then hopefully see if those lions pop out as well. Okay, let's do that. Now I'm going to try... Okay, I think while I, while I do that, I'm just going to try and actually turn around and do this a bit easier. Uh, off you go across uh, to Ben to see what Marie's is up to and what Ben's plans are for the rest of the morning. Well, Marie's is playing with his food. He's decided that for whatever reason the branch that he was on was not to his liking. So he's tried about two or three different places now and he still hasn't made his mind up where he is going to enjoy the remains of this breakfast. So apologies any sensitive viewers, but no, this is all good for a leopard. That's going to be a bit dangerous if you just leave it in that fork. I would think Rips a hyena might be able to jump up there if he leaves a leg dangling down. Oh, he's going to come down. He's just checking if there's any hyenas. Sorry about the bush there, just going to see where he goes. He did this yesterday. I think he's decided it's too warm up there. Uh, he doesn't have enough shade. Uh, he's going to take it under a bush, I would think. He's going pretty much behind the vehicle now. They're going to have to see where he goes and then reposition, I'm afraid. But see, there's not much shade on that tree. And with the sun coming from this side where we're parked, we've got the sun behind us. He was beginning to uh, get full sunlight. Uh, and this is Africa and it's December, which is height of summer. It's almost the solstice, of course. Longest day of the year is the 21st. All right, let me just let just good. There's one other vehicle in the sighting with me, so I'm just going to let them position themselves. We try not to have more than one vehicle moving at a time, just for uh, ethical considerations of not having too many engines running and putting unnecessary strain on the animal. So we'll just let them decide what they're doing and then we'll get you another look. But what a spectacular, spectacular way to start the morning! But yes, yeah, so when we first uh, saw the uh, the carcass yesterday morning we didn't see any sign of the leopard oh he's doing a complete loop he's actually coming past us again to see where he ends up um, and then when we came back in the afternoon we couldn't find the uh, the kill so he'd taken the kill out of the tree and stashed it under a bush I wonder if he's going to take it back to that same bush <laughs>
activity. Uh, what I assume is Gingrika again came in just as Moritz had stashed his kill under a guari bush. Um, and Rich just saw him coming in time and managed to just jump up this little quarry that he'd uh, decided to go under. The hyena had a, uh, an attempt to climb up after him. They snarled at each other, but as you can see, he's still got that Dacre clamps in his jaws, but he almost, almost lost it. Um, it was probably, he had about 30 centimetres uh, to save it there, but he saw the hyena just as it was approaching. And he's only about... Well, two meters off the ground and so the hyena had a had an attempt to sort of climb up the tree but hyenas are not known for their tree climbing abilities luckily for Marips. That was a little bit of excitement but again hyenas decided better of it and has wandered off already. You survived Marips. you almost lost it. That is the danger of taking a kill out of a tree. He made the decision that it was too hot, uh, decided to leave the sanctity of that or the sanctuary oh, <laughs> the sanctuary of that marula and he just made himself comfortable under this guari bush in a little bit of a nest that he's got down there and much more shade. But yes, the second you do that, you become far more vulnerable to the inevitable hyenas that are always skulking around in the darkness and the undergrowth. I think he's just trying to wedge this dacre now in the guari and he'll probably just lie down under the guari. But if that hyena comes back, if he leaves it where it is now, I have no doubt the hyena could jump up and grab a limb it's a fairly dense bush, I'm afraid, so you basically just see his tail sticking out there. Oh. Oh. oh, he's made a break for it. He's made a break back for the for, to the tree. Oh. He managed to, oh, he's managed to get it up the tree there. The hyena was on its way back again. Let me just reposition so we don't have that aerial on the way but there is the hyena you good if i move right? or are you just going to be happy to do that okay we'll just hold the aerial for now but yeah he made a break for it but decided maybe the tree is the better option that was close boy twice you almost lost it now i wonder if he'll i think probably decide that a little bit of heat is worth it now that he knows that this hyena is definitely hanging around and with two close calls, I'm sure that hyena is going to position itself here for a little while just to see if makes another mistake. But he's an experienced boy now at two and a half. He's been independent for quite a while. He knows what he's doing. Uh, but that was a close call. One of the very few times I've seen a leopard sort of fall out of a tree, but he was in a bit of a panic, I think, to get up the tree and just made it. But phew. watching the hyena. You don't even need to show you the hyena, you can just watch his eyes following his nemesis. Yes, you are king, my boy. Uh, morning, Tammy. Um, well, I suppose yes or no, again, it depends sort of how you want that to be answered in terms of interpret interpreting it. Um, generally speaking, a leopard won't put up much of a fight. The hyena is a powerful, powerful animal. Um, and despite the fact that, you know, in a, in a single fight, it might be sort of 50-50, the leopard is not willing to risk injury uh, for the sake of you know, half, a, half a dacre that is left. And nine times out of ten, if the hyena grabs it, the leopard will just sort of give it up. Occasionally they'll fight for it if they think they can get it to a safe position again. Um, but generally speaking, the hyenas will will win that exchange. Although that being said, I have seen leopards chase off hyenas before. I have even seen a leopard and a hyena happily both feeding on an inyala that the leopard took out. One was feeding on one side and the, the other was on the other side. And there seemed to have been some sort of unspoken truce between them. But that was at a time where food had been fairly scarce, if I recall. That was in the western sector of the Sabi Sands around Delini, I think many years ago now so we always say nature doesn't read the textbook but more often than not no, if a hyena comes calling if the leopard can't get somewhere safe it will rather get itself somewhere safe and abandon the food it's just not worth risking injury 
rather give up your food and he's ducked into the branches there give up your foods live to hunt another day and learn from your mistakes okay let's see if we can reposition get another view of Maribs he's disappeared into those branches there but he was obviously getting hot in the morning sunlight which is what led to this whole thing and uh, yeah maybe he will also learn from that exchange I'm sure there was a flurry of excitement though always nice to see an interaction Try here for now and just see what he does. So he's got the Dacre slung across the fork of this marula. This is the sort of neighbouring marula to the one that he had originally. Oops. still sniffing around underneath there's a little bit of flesh still on the marula above the hyena at the moment um, I'm sure that's also I think where the stomach content uh, ended up over there which is why I assume this is still Gingrika is having a good snuffle around on the floor here looking for some scraps oh sorry she's right behind my head Uh, Mac, that right there that you're looking at is the purpose of hanging a kill in a tree. Uh, it's the safest place to put your food. It's like storing it in a cupboard and locking it away so you don't have to share it with anybody. Hyenas cannot climb trees. They don't have nice, sharp, protractable claws like leopards do. They're very sort of front heavy. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's not the most dexterous and agile of animals, hyena, built very much for power. So if you can take your uh, tree your, your tree up a food if you can take your food up a tree you keep it away from marauding hyenas like this and it's quite normal if you find a leopard just to have a hyena following the leopard because the hyena knows that chances are the predator will make a kill and because of his power difference uh, he'll just be able to take that kill and the leopard won't put up much of a fight so put it up into a tree and it completely removes the problems of hyenas they will often sort of even lie under the tree and sleep under the tree hoping that the leopard drops something or a piece of meat falls off or a leg dangles down or something and then they might try and jump up and grab it. Uh, lions as well can't really climb trees. They can on occasion so yes you can climb a tree to get away from a lion but be prepared that if it really wants to it could potentially climb up there after you but it is very uh, unstable in a tree again because of its much heavier weight but I have seen I've seen a male lion lying in a uh, in a tree before feasting on a leopard's kill so if the lion's really got the bit between his teeth that he wants that food it may well find a way so ultimately it's to keep your food safe and that is why leopards pop them up into trees and then it's generally quite relaxed it'll sit there and feed for the next you know 24 48 hours depending on what the animal is and how much meat is there uh, until he's finished so it just enables him him or her to eat in peace is going back to check under the bush I think where it originally put the food but that was a little bit of excitement certainly I think we're gonna to have to move again we've just got a view of a tail now and go back oh where are you going now no he's on the move again all right I'm just gonna give him a, a chance to decide where he wants to settle down now I don't think he's gonna take it out of the tree again after what just happened so we'll just see where he plops himself down and we will reposition for you. I suppose I need to pay 
And the hippopotamus a little bit of attention, considering I've ignored him all morning long. I'm very sorry, hippo. But you haven't been doing anything too spectacular. He's gone underwater, but maybe he's going to create the fountain. Um, he blows some serious bubbles under the water and then it's like kind of looks like chocolate milk. You know, if you put a straw in chocolate milk and then you blow into the straw and you get that bubbling effect, that's exactly um, what the hippo was doing just now. I'm not sure why he's doing it, but he's, he's done it a couple of times. I think he's probably annoyed that we are here. He just wants some peace and quiet to just, you know, relax, eventually go to sleep. Probably lonely. Well, something I'll definitely do. Maybe this afternoon um, we'll head round towards Chitwa Dam. I think it's going to stay hot like this. Maybe we'll get some elephants. Or I haven't seen a little hippopotamus in a couple of weeks now. And I love baby hippos. They're my favourite. So we'll be on the on the search for uh, a few of those. But those are some good looking ears. If I've ever seen them before. Nice reflection <laughs> as well. Not really partaking in... Uh, this morning safari that's okay if you'd like to let us know what time you'll be leaving the dam this evening then we can come and meet you here and watch you exit the water that could be quite interesting but you probably won't oblige typical wildlife likes to make it so difficult for us <laughs> no sight of the lions so hey, we did see them moving briefly but i think that they've just sat down again um, so i'm not really rushing over to them i don't think that they're going to get up to too much this morning unless something literally steps on them like the zebra almost did I wonder if he closes his eyes under the water it must be not quite nice and cool and maybe it's like wearing an eye mask to kind of keep the sun out of your eyes I wonder if it has that effect because it is murky it's not like you can really see through the water anyways shame why don't you get two leaves and place them over your eyes that would work if only hippos had thumbs. Okay, Marips is just sheltering up there in the shade, still watching Ingrika. She's patrolling around the base of the tree now, but he's got his take a kill well stash hung over that fork in the tree but uh, Kinkuka has sort of done a couple of laps now gone back to check where he almost grabbed the food that was under that quarry bush having a good sniff around but eventually I think will probably give up and disappear but whether it'll just go and lie somewhere in the shade and hope that Marips makes another mistake we'll have to wait and see but that was a very exciting little flurry of activity for 10-15 minutes so to have those interactions between different species uh, is what it's all about ecosystems are made up of say multiple different facets that all interact with each other and as stressful as it is for the leopard the hyena needs to eat too or they could actually go and hunt for itself but that's what makes these exchanges so fascinating watching their lives unfurl see that dacre at the bottom of the screen there sort of safely now slung over that fork in the tree there's not much left of the hindquarters but there's still enough food there to keep him occupied for the rest of the day I would think I think there's a very good chance especially with the uh, temperatures today that he will still be around this afternoon. I can't believe he'll go far, so unless he goes for a drink. <laughs> uh, Jackie, I suppose uh, most of the time, yes, they will usually open the stomach first uh, because they want to get to those vital organs, the heart, liver, lungs, kidneys, those sorts of things. They are packed full of protein. Very, very good for a growing boy like Marips. Uh, and then obviously that once you've opened the stomach that gives you very good access to the rest of uh, the flesh in there and the meat and the muscle and all the other good stuff uh, but he will also open other parts of the the carcass at some point i'm sure he'll chew on a few legs here and there uh, even around the skull potentially he may also have a chew 
otherwise, if they don't go for the soft belly, it's also the softest skin sort of around the groin area. That's normally where they will start. Uh, otherwise, around the sort of the buttocks and the flanks, sometimes they'll go in that way. Uh, but generally speaking, you have to open it. And what they'll also do before sort of taking it into a tree, it's not unusual for a leopard to take out the stomach contents uh, because they don't want to eat or carry around all that extra weight. Obviously, uh, a ruminating animal or a ruminant animal has got all those different stomachs and is storing a lot of extra weight. And if you've got to take it up a tree, you rather reduce the weight. That being said, they are also quite well known to, to sort of not want to open the stomach uh, because that gives off a very pungent smell and is ringing the dinner bell for the hyenas. So sort of very much depends on the situation, I suppose. But if they do take the stomach out, it's also quite normal to watch uh, a leopard and lions, for that matter, sort of scrape over uh, plant material and dirt on top of it, probably to just sort of reduce that smell as well. But animal life is relatively simple. They don't overcomplicate it the way we do. Rather go for the softest, most nutritious parts first. And that normally involves having to open the, the underside. And so as unpleasant a topic as it was, with it being this time of year, we when we were here yesterday, obviously she'd opened, he'd opened this uh, female dacre here. And there was a very sort of fairly highly developed fetus inside there which was also removed and that has been I assume completely consumed those uh, the skeleton that fetus wouldn't have been fully formed yet it would still be a little bit soft and cartilaginous and I would imagine he was eaten that entire thing from head to tail I'm afraid <laughs> still watching Greekers having a look around uh, under that bush where he almost lost his kill to the hyena just now just watching very carefully. So for a little bit of shake there, we were very zoomed in and the, the breeze has just picked up. I think Owen's going to try and show you the hyena right behind us. There, that's that little gory bush. That's where Maribs was lying with his kill when King Greek again and he sort of flew up the branch here. <laughs> what are you doing, Greek? I think he was just trying to check if maybe there's still some debris left up in the the, uh, the branches of this quarry. And now you'll see why hyenas can't climb trees. <laughs> Diggs tried to do some pruning. You're supposed to have some of the strongest jaws in the animal kingdom, just bite it off. I've never seen this behaviour before. I assume he's just trying to clear himself a bit of a path so he can try to clamber up there and see if there's any sort of uh, any little morsels that got trapped up there. Or he's very frustrated. Maritz <laughs> is just watching on with a sort of a little bit of amusement in his face, I think. Is that it? Yeah, a vegan hyena, He's given up hope. Starting his New Year's resolution early. Dykers are friends, not food. It was that Finding Nemo, wasn't it, with the shark? <laughs> it's not there anymore, Greek Air. But you can see there's there's absolutely no grip. I mean, it looks like he's trying to shimmy up a drain pipe and, and struggling badly there. <laughs> Legs flapping around in front of him. I'm not actually sure. Is Gingrigo a he or a she? It is a he, I thought so. Okay, whilst we uh, amuse ourselves with this hyena's antics, uh, let's send you across to Chris and see how things are on Pridelands. This is one phenomenon that we see usually after rains. Now, in a moment, we'll show you the context of this, but look at that. 
hundreds and thousands of alates emerging from the ground. Just look at that. So these are emerging very close to one of these termite mounts. You can actually see the mount there. So we're not going to speak about the termite mount as such. The termite mount is purely there to regulate gases and heat. We're going to speak about the alates. So remember that this termite colony is expansive underground. So what you see in the mount is just the tip of the iceberg, proverbially. Right, so now after the rain, the alates emerge. So their purpose is they are fertile males and females and their sole purpose is to start new termite colonies. So remember when termites are born, they are in a nymph stadium uh, and those are both infertile, well not, uh, uh, immature males and females. So they get fed in a very specific manner. Some of the males are fed to become soldiers. But after rains, the queen releases certain pheromones and that prompts the workers to feed certain, although a large number of them, of those to become fully fledged, winged, fertile males and females. And that's what we are seeing here. And their purpose is to find a mate in air, again by the use of pheromones. Once they found the mate, they'll drop to the ground. They'll dig into the ground. They'll create the small royal chamber and then start mating and the new queen will then start laying eggs. Sometimes they might even reignite, if I can say, old extinct termite mounts. That can also happen. And the reason why they do it after rain is because the soil is damp and soft. It's easier for them to get underground. Now, probably 90% of these guys will die. It sounds harsh, but they're a major food source for plenty creatures. So their success rate's quite low. That's why they have to push out thousands of these guys every time it rains. Isn't that sorry, incredible? So this is one of the fungus growers, very likely the large fungus grower. Uh, the genus Macrotermes, large termite, Macrotermes. Actually, I'm going to do one day. We'll just do a theme, or a themed safari where I'm going to just focus on the explanation of biological names, but not today. Macrotermes, large termite. So there's the large fungus grower, very likely Macrotermes natalensis, referring to the province of Natal. But as far as I can see into the light, you see alates. There are, I, want, I would say millions, actually. Everywhere you see they're emerging. Remember termites, if we take all the termites on the globe, you put them on one heap and all other animals, from the biggest to the smallest, on another pile. The termites will outweigh and outnumber all other animal life on the planet. That's how many termites there are on the globe. This is phenomenal. So if we were stuck in the bush, remember one of my key interests is bush survival and edibles. So if you come across this, if you're stuck in the bush, this is gold because these are edible. Hello there, Maddie. Thank you so much for that compliment. Says Chris, you're a walking encyclopedia, a viva encyclopedia. Thank you so much, Matty. It's a result of 22, 23 years of professional nature guiding. I still don't know it all. It's quite humbling. You can compare it with a glass of water, where the glass is your capacity or you, what you think you can know, and the water you add is the knowledge. And the problem is, every time you get to a point where you think your glass is full, the glass just gets bigger and you need to keep adding. It's quite a frustrating but very rewarding thing there. 
You cannot know everything. It's a lot I still don't know and want to know. It's a lifelong study, put it that way. Now these guys are very, very, very good to consume. Uh, rich in fats. Good fats. As well as almost in one of the best sources of protein around. Wild Earth Explorers, this one's for you. You stand a chance to head off to the wondrous Camp Fig Tree Mountain Safari Lodge, situated on the border of Addo Elephant National Park, for an unforgettable three night stay for two. Witness the incredible elephant herds at Addo firsthand and explore with an open vehicle safari tailored to you or a relaxing bush picnic. Sign up to be an explorer to treat yourself to a much needed get. Well, it seems I like Gingrika an apology. I've just been updated that Gingrika is in fact a female, not a male. I do apologise, Gingrika. Uh, Gingrika has decided. Gingrika, the, the hyena. That's easier. Uh, has decided um, to rather just take up residence here in the shade and see if Marips drops anything else. He's still considering going back to that quarry. I think there might be a little bit of. Um, blood or something still in that tree that she was trying to get at before but I just decided to uh, have a bit of a rest in the shade I think uh, Maritz has been moving around up in the tree trying to decide what he wants to do uh, he keeps dislodging a little bit of bark and every time a little bit of bark falls uh, down to the ground the hyena rushes over to see just in case it was uh, not a piece of bark and perhaps a little bit of food So I just need to give an update on the radio. Uh, you're welcome to approach. It's just myself here. Come across quarantine and take that little link that goes down past some better house. You'll see the Morvan Quanzel going south about 300 meters down. So we very much have a standoff. Both of them are having a bit of a break now. You're going to get hot, boy, and find a nice shady spot. At least this ruler, I think, has got a little bit more shade up at the top of the tree where he is now. I wouldn't be surprised if he moves again because quite a lot of him is in sort of sunlight there. 
and said it's the reason he took the kill down in the first place is he decided he was a bit too exposed and was warming up a bit too much. You can see the heavy panting. I figured he's got a, a full belly as well. Good look at the spot pattern there on the top line of the whiskers. One of the ways that we identify leopards, we count those spots up there and give them a sort of how many on the left and how many on the right. We also look for little scars or nicks out of the ears, but uh, say one of Maribs's defining characteristic is those fluffy ears. You can see those very hairy ears, which kind of acts like a filter to keep the ears clean. Uh, Stefan. To be honest, something small like a diker, Marips is going to eat the majority of it. Um, he, may, he may even sort of crunch on the legs a little bit. Again, there's perfectly good marrow and calcium in those leg bones. It's a shame he's drooling a bit. <laughs> um, but obviously he won't, he won't eat the skull. Um, but to be honest, he's going to finish most of it. He won't eat the skin. They don't generally eat, eat the skin. Uh, they won't eat the hair. They generally won't eat the hooves. Uh, but pretty much all of the, the meaty bits on something small like this, um, it will consume most of it. How about those for a set of teeth, eh? Hey? Look at those canines. You would not want to find yourself in between those. But they are designed to grip hold of the windpipe, uh, to cut off oxygen flow on larger prey. Smaller prey will be dispatched with a swift bite to the back of the neck, often severing the spinal column and uh, pretty much causing instant death or at least incapacitation for the animal. You see a tick there, you know? Well, they do be difficult for leopards and lions and things when you don't have opposable thumbs. Hello, yes, we're talking about you. Uh, they do often get ticks, especially around their eyes. It's always horrible to see a tick on their eyes and they struggle to get them off. Is it too hot there, boy? Are you going for food or are you going for more shade? No, possibly food. He may, of course, just... He won't mind that the hyena's here now. He knows his food is safe. He may actually just come down from the tree and go and settle under a bush somewhere. Him and the hyena don't have any beef together, or any dacre, I suppose we should say, this morning. Uh, they'll quite happily sleep close together um, on the floor. The hyena is not interested in trying to... Um, it sort of take on the leopard. So you may find that he's going to just leave the kill up there for now. He's thinking about some food, but I think he's getting too hot. He's a little bit indecisive. Just fell down there. I see Gingrich is having a good look, but it's possibly learnt from previous experience. It hasn't caused her to go and have a little sniff around. Uh, Alex, yes, that would happen. A, there's always a bigger fish in the pond, as, as we say, and if a big territorial male, if uh, Mawati was to turn up here, for example, being the dominant male of this area, uh, and Rips, remember, is still not fully grown yet, he's around about two and a half years of age, uh, then yes, uh, Mawati would quite happily turn up here and Rips will, I would think, bow to his superior size and territoriality uh, and make a, a swift getaway and then uh, another more dominant leopard will quite happily take over uh, and finish up what is left. That's not unusual. Uh, occasionally, or in fact, if related leopards, you may even find them uh, feeding on the carcass together. I remember, geez, it was last year now, I think, when I was here, uh, I had a sighting where we had five, well, I saw four of them in a tree, 
uh, and I know when Kelly was out in the afternoon, we had five leopards all basically on the same, sharing the same carcass. We had Columba and her two cubs, which were probably about four or five months at a time. Uh, Mawati was there as well as the. Um, he had actually stolen the kill off uh, Columba, and she was trapped in the tree and was struggling to get past him to get down. He didn't actually eat anything at that point. After a while, he just sort of left the area, came back a little bit later. But also then Tundi arrived as well, Columba's mother. Um, and we had the, the four of them. Uh, Mawati wasn't around at that moment, but we had the four of them in the tree all together, which is ridiculous to see five leopards in one sighting. is almost unheard of. So yes, a leopard, a bigger leopard will steal food from a smaller one. Males will steal from females. But very much depends on who's in the area and the population density, of course, around about that time. I think he's debating about coming down and going to uh, find himself a bush to lie under. He keeps glancing back up at the food. I don't honestly think he's hungry. It's just sort of trying to persuade himself that he can leave it safely in the tree now. Okay, let's see what decisions Marips makes here, but let's send you back across to Chris and Pridelands and see what's happening over there. Wow, look at that really spectacular scene there. Got this lone wildebeest bull on his little pedestal there. And we'll get back to that just now with the Drakensberg in the background. That is not Marib's cop we're looking at. It's a portion of the mountain a touch further north that sort of escarp that we see to the left of the sequence. That is Chuaneng. So that marks the exit point, the northern exit point of the Blyde River Canyon. Beautiful, look at those cliffs. And then our wildebeest. Now these wildebeest, the blue wildebeest that we have up here in this part of the world, the males seek territories. They don't necessarily migrate here like they do in East Africa or other parts of Africa. <coughs> excuse me what they do actually do the males will find a good grazing lawn or a grazing area much like impala plains where we are with good access to water and they'll establish a territory in the hope to attract herds of females so these females are not bound to territories they'll move between territories of males and and that's again where it's the way they are designed. You want the strongest animal to breed. So the females then will obviously be attracted to the area with the best grazing and access to the best water. So therefore the strongest male will get the best areas. That is how they are made. And often you'll find them on a light, slightly elevated area. And then the way these males advertise their territories by several different means. Uh, firstly, vocalization. I'm sure you've some stage on the show have heard them they've got that gnu like sound and that's where the name gnu came from like gnu, gnu. then the second way is to scrape the ground they've got these little patches where they scrape the ground even eventually creating a depression uh, with the front hoofs and there's a gland in between the hoofs there referred to as an interdigital gland and then another way they do it is through the preorbital glands. What does preorbital mean? Orbits, eye sockets. Pre meaning in front or before it. 
So just in front of the eye, they've got these, and we can actually see the little bumps between the eye and the nose. Two little bumps on each side, and that is the preorbital gland that also secretes chemicals and substances that they rub against plants to assist in advertising that this is his place. And why we want to do that? Firstly, you want to tell other males moving through the area, this is occupied territory. When you come through here, you behave. Otherwise, there's going to be some fighting. But it also tells the ladies that this is occupied area. There's a potential suitor around. Isn't that just incredible? I feel very educational today. It is such a lovely scene. Beautiful. Beautiful. Hi there, Frank. Good morning. Frank had a question here. I just broke up a little bit. I'm just going to ask MC to re queue that question for me. My apologies, everybody. Love to answer Frank's question. Frank says, this wildebeest chews like a wise old wizard. <laughs> Love that comment, Frank. And what he's chewing is, in fact, yesterday we spoke about ruminating. So he's ruminating at the moment. For those who are not familiar with the term, you will probably be familiar with the term. Okay, so Marubs has come down out of the tree and he's gone back. He, him and uh, Ganguku are just playing musical chairs at the moment. He's gone back to the quarry where he was trying to relax, where he took the kill earlier before the hyena disturbed him. And he's finally come out of the tree, came down, had a bit of a look at Ganguku, had a bit of a snarl, and I think he's trying to decide where he's going to lie up for a little bit. Finds a nice shady spot. And apparently that is as good a place as any. Thank you, boy. That is like the most perfect position for us that you could have chosen. So he's got a view of his kill and the hyena from there. how small his pupils are. They've almost dilated to only a, a few millimeters wide. Of course, the cats have that ability to open those pupils wide in low light conditions. They've got incredible night vision. They have what's called dichromatic vision. So they do see a little bit of color, but it's the majority will be black and white. of a leopard. It's a wonderful documentary actually if anybody wants to watch a, a beautiful documentary. Leopards is one called The Eye of the Leopard 
following a leopard in Botswana. Much from birth, her uh, life as a cub, uh, all the way up until she is, establishes her own territory. Uh, one of some absolutely beautiful camera work. I think it's a Derek and Beverly Joubert documentary, uh, narrated by Jeremy Irons. Aesthetically, one of the most beautiful um, documentaries I've ever watched. We're talking about those eyes. So they've got. So there are two types of visual cells. You have rods and cones. Cones for color vision. Rods for night vision. Uh, our eyes are dominated by cones because we're daytime animals. But leopard being generally nocturnal, they have many, many, many more rods than we do. And those rods are aided by an enzyme known as rhodopsin. Uh, and leopards. And lions have huge amounts of rhodopsin to really increase the efficiency of that night vision. So even on a moonless night, they can see almost perfectly. But it's similar to our IR camera. So Marips looks like he's settled. It's the second or third time he's come and laid down in this exact spot and then keeps getting, say, sort of harassed by Gingrika, who has disappeared from view now. I'm not sure if she has completely gone or if she's just loitering in the shadows somewhere. But I think he's trying to prep himself for a bit of a late morning snooze. Try and digest some of that protein that he has taken in last night. Time for a bit of a bath, but I understand his requirement for shade. It really is warming up. I'm going to have to start applying some sun cream shortly. At least I don't have a big fur coat uh, to have to deal with as well. It's probably a good time to remind you, of course, that we are in the midst of our 12 days of Christmas bingo challenge. So every afternoon between now and Christmas Day, uh, myself and all the other naturalists are, have some Christmas-themed bingo boards and we are trying to best one another on every afternoon safari. We'll be doing that, say, for the 12 days of Christmas. So I think we've done, what, three now, so we must be nine days to Christmas now. Uh, and there'll be a, a cumulative title that uh, we will announce the winner on Christmas Day. So to give you an update, day one was uh, was a draw, that was a non-result. Very happy to say that uh, myself and Owen were successful on day two, and yesterday the bingo king himself, Cedric, reclaimed top spot. And we'll see what happens this afternoon. Cedric's not out this afternoon, it'll be myself and Taylor, so at least we won't have to, uh, to take on the master. but always a little bit of fun in the afternoons. But a good time for a little bit of a groom. That tongue we were talking about earlier, not only is it perfect for stripping flesh off bone, but it's also great for removing stuff um, that get stuck in the fur, their ticks, and also removing any sort of entrails and blood and guts that have got stuck in that fur. Uh, Jordan, sorry, I heard the question, but I did not hear who it was from. Could you just repeat for me, please?
Brian, my apologies, Brian. Um, Brian, well, the largest thing I've seen up a tree uh, that a leopard has hoisted up there is a baby giraffe. A baby giraffe at birth is around somewhere between 100 to 120 kilograms, so about 250 pounds. Um, in fairness, I think the stomach content and some of the uh, insides had been removed, but it is possible, we believe, for a leopard to potentially hoist something that weighs double its own body weight up into a tree. Um, or certainly, say, for a big leopard of around about, say, 70 to 80 kilograms, of which Marips is not quite there yet. He's probably hovering around the 60 kilogram mark at the moment, I would think. Uh, but it's certainly possible for a leopard to take something over 100 kilograms up into a tree, which is, I myself do not weigh that much. So it's quite a humbling thought to think that I could be stashed in the, those massive incisor, uh, sorry, canine teeth that we saw earlier and be dragged up a tree. And if you really think about it, that is such an impressive feat of strength because it's not like you and I, we might sort of sling it over our shoulders or something uh, and then climb up a tree. He's holding it in his mouth and just using the strength in his shoulders and back legs to grip hold of the bark and will go up a vertical trunk, not using branches for help. So not only the power to get it up there, but the coordination with limbs and a dead weight hanging in its mouth is uh, quite the feat of strength. So yeah, baby giraffe. I've seen a baby giraffe in a tree. We've seen some unusual stuff slung in trees. I've seen aardvark hanging in a tree before. Oh, bless you, a bit of a furball. But say, so it's not every day that uh, they will take such large items of prey. They will concentrate mostly on, say, impalas, dacus, steenbok. That sort of prey range up to about sort of 60, 70 kilograms. But uh, they are more than capable of taking out much, much heavier items than that. I've seen a male leopard about this size. I mentioned it yesterday, take out a fully grown male kudu, which is sort of 250 kilograms. Didn't put it up into a tree, but still to have the power to subdue such a large animal is mightily impressive. Okay, let's send you back across to Taylor and see how her morning is going. Well, we eventually left Treehouse Dam because there was just really nothing else to talk about. We'll save some content for maybe this afternoon. Um, so we're just on a little bit of a bumble now, just seeing what we can find. But I'm going to continue the conversation that you were having with Ben. And, um, yeah, talking about animals hoisting trees. Definitely see lots of uh, young giraffe up in trees before from leopards, especially in Kenya. We used to see that quite often. Um, and then... The other crazy thing I was going to mention, I'm sure you all remember Tamba, uh, one of Tandi's uh, sons, but from quite a quite a while ago. He hangs around, I think he's yeah, down on the west to sort of central Sabi sand. And then I'll never forget the one day we were on a bushwalk, this was years ago, and it was just on the other side of Weotela Dam, just a little bit to the north. And we could smell carcass, we, there were lots of leopard tracks around. Eventually we found a fully grown female kudu carcass, which was insane. And then like you could see how whoever had killed it completely struggled with it. So lots of bite marks here, lots of uh, bites and scratches here. And then the belly was just completely serrated. Um, I don't know if for those of you who have got cats at home, I'm sure at some point they would have grabbed hold of you and done that thing where they kind of attack you and their legs sort of scratchy. So I imagine that this leopard did this. We didn't know who it was at first and then we figured out that it was Tumba that did that and he was, I don't know, I can't remember how old he was, but he, he was maybe a year and a half or maybe, yeah, yeah, maybe a year and a half, maybe closer to 20 months old, something like that, but was very impressive. Never underestimate the strength um, of, these, of these animals. So yeah, gosh. I'm trying to think what other weird things I've seen up in trees. Porcupine, I've seen a porcupine in a tree before. That was cool. They don't, they don't typically climb trees. They like to eat the roots though. Uh, and then of course, python. I mean, pythons are normally up in trees, but I've seen leopard eating a big python before. There's an old female known as the white dam female, but she's no longer alive down towards the Sabi sand. 
watched her eat a python. It was huge. I don't know if she put it in the tree or if it was in the tree and she killed it, but I suspect she must have tried to hoist it up because the tail was kind of dangling and just the head was sort of draped over. So I imagine it was, um, yeah, something that she took up there. I can't believe how dense it is. It's short, sure, it's quite something. So we just taking it very easy just keeping an eye out I'd obviously love to spend some time with elephants and my favorite animals I definitely need some elephant therapy um, but we will we'll see how that goes too hello everyone my name is Tanya Ray I'm from the United Kingdom I am absolutely thrilled to have won a stay at the Itali Safari Lodge. For me, this is like a dream come true. And I would just like to say, thank you very much, Wild Earth. Sign up and it could be you getting out there, experiencing it for yourself. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. Okay, well, Marips has moved on a little bit. Uh, he has moved probably about 100 metres away from that uh, kill now. I think possibly he was on his way to some water, but he's just been distracted. I can hear some oxpeckers behind me. I think there's a couple of impala milling around in the bushes, uh, which is possibly what he's looking at. Of course, leopards are opportunistic. He may have a kill in the tree and he may have a very full belly, but if there's an opportunity to cache something else, then why not? So we will have to see what happens here. I haven't got visual of the Impala at the moment, but so I can hear oxpeckers behind me. But I think Owen said he saw a, a brief glimpse of some in the bushes there. But we certainly haven't got, uh, Marips is not locked on to a target yet, but classic leopard fashion lying on a termite mound getting a good view. Instinct is instinct. You can't quell instinct if there's food to be had. You never know. I have before seen a leopard in a tree with three kills. There's actually some alarm calls of impalas from behind me, but I don't think it's for Marips. going to give an update 
on the radio quickly in case there's anybody else in the area. We know we had Columbus tracks, we think, in this area last night as well. Uh, stations as Marlock Colouring, Twin Dams Road, uh, somewhere between Ingway Alley and Warburg's Nest. I've still got my ribs here, um, but colouring close to this lock. Uh, they were still around Treehouse Dam. I'm not sure of the exact lock. As far as I know, they've been left unattended. Uh, well, yes, they do. In fact, we've watched yesterday, we watched Marips cough up a fur ball, and this morning he had a bit of a, a frog in his throat as well. Uh, so they do. They obviously were in the process of feeding. They do swallow a lot of fur, and sometimes there are other indigestible parts of bone and things that need to come out. Uh, so normally the first thing they'll do is they'll sort of pluck some of the fur off the kill, and they've got, obviously in between those massive canines that you can see there, they have... Uh, very sort of small incisor of teeth which when they close their mouth sort of um, lock together very very closely and they will use those to pluck uh, the fur out of uh, kill items, prey items, they'll also pluck feathers off birds and things as well. So they do inadvertently digest quite a lot of fur and so keratin is non-digestible um, so it's either going to get passed through and you'll find a lot of fur and small uh, pieces of bone in leopard, lion, uh, scat um, and the rest of it, yes, will be will be coughed up. I keep sort of look, trying to look behind me to see what Marips is looking at. I'm sure there are some Impala there. I can hear Impala in the distance, but he will also hear those alarm calls, uh, and I'm sure he knows they're not for him. So it's possible that we may be graced by a visit from Columba as well, if she was to get scent of this. That would be an interesting interaction. You see anything down there, eh? Can you see the impalas? Yeah. Okay, so somewhere behind us there are some impalas in the okay, I can see the impalas just sort of through the back of the vehicle, but there are one of them is looking in this direction, but I'm pretty sure they weren't alarming Marips. I'd be very surprised if they could see him. Okay, we're gonna see what happens here. Let's send you back across to Chris, who I think has located a very large elephant. There is definitely an influx of breeding herds of elephants. This is now the second breeding herd we've seen today. It could be the same herd we saw this morning. I'm just trying to count them and see if those two cow, uh, look, calves are present. I don't see those very small calves though, so it might be a different herd. Could possibly be related to that herd that we seen earlier. You often see related groups moving into an area like this. I just love it how they are moving through the woods here. Hoping that they will stick around for this afternoon. Yo, there's a lot of midges around. Goodness. Possibly following these elephants. But I think they're on their way to HQ water roll. We're quite close. Well, Waldorf knows that you all have been enjoying the wild show and you probably have a lot of questions. So, 
James Henry will be doing a wild show hangout, and this will only be for explorers. And this will be on Sunday, the 18th of December. And he's going to chat about how it's going, and he's going to be there to answer any questions you might have. And this will happen at exactly 8 p.m. Central African time. So do not miss that. None other than James Henry. Special Wild Show Hangout. 18th of December, 8 p.m. CAT. Hi there, Martha. Martha wants to know if there's a resident herd of elephants at Pridelands. Martha, um, I'm going to try and explain it in this way. These elephants have home ranges and they are very large. They have thousands and thousands of hectares that they move along. And Pridelands makes up a small portion of that. So, in a way, yes, there are resident herds, but that residence of theirs or the rim is not a territory, it's a home range, are thousands, thousands, thousands of hectares. Which means that at times they will spend time on dragons, but there's a lot of times they will not be here because Pridelands only makes up a very, very small portion of any particular herd's home range. So that is why we at times we'll see a lot of elephants and there's times we will see almost none as they move in and out of the area. Remember that Pridelands is a property owned by people and it's marked by roads. Our borders are mere roads, especially those with our neighbors, which are all of them from part of the Greater Baluli Conservancy which in turn forms part of the Greater Kruger Park, which is an area just in South Africa, which is around 2.2 million hectares, which is about 5 million acres. But it also extends in Mozambique as well as Zimbabwe, which in total is close to 10 million acres of uninterrupted conservation land, which is amazing. I think we need to move away from here. There is midges biting me like crazy. <laughs> Woo. It's not the heat, it's midges. And at night, mosquitoes. I've even been stung by hissing ants the other day. That was rather painful. <laughs> sure. Where did these midges come from? No, I think we should move away. It is becoming quite a, quite a nuisance now. Goodness. Now I'm leaving. These things are biting. Sorry. Right, I'm going to try and get away from all these midges. Let's go over to Ben, who's still with my ribs. I'm going to have to drive fast to get away from these things. Yeah, shame, Chris. Uh, take cover. Uh, ribs has just moved again. I'm just trying to put us in a position where we can see him. I don't know if he's potentially interested in these impalas. He's still looking at something. Oh, yes, yeah, just debating if Talumba did turn up. It might be an interesting interaction. Of course, they are both uh, cubs from Tundi, but with different fathers, if I stand to be correct, Lid. But I believe, uh, obviously, Mawati is uh, Marips's father, and I think Tingana was Columba's father, so that does make them a sort of brother and sister. 
interesting to see an interaction, but he's big enough that I don't think... I think we might just have to do a slightly longer range visual for now. I don't know if could you work with that? Okay. It's just quite a few bushes and things in the way, and I don't want to get too close to him. I was <laughs> applying some sun cream a little earlier when we were parked about 10 metres away from him, and he took exception to me rubbing my arm and gave me quite the, the growl, and it is very intimidating when a leopard growls at you from pretty much point-blank range. So I'm just giving him a little bit of space this morning. So it is, it is warm, he's got a full belly, so he's a little bit grumpy and he's been harassed by Ingrika all morning. But I wouldn't realize if he's sort of slowly making his way to go and find some water, but he's going the opposite direction to Gary Dam. He's going away. He's going the opposite direction to Gary Dam. He's going away from Gary Dam. But say after the rain we had the other day, there are quite a few puddles. Little all the seasonal pans have got a little bit of water in, and leopards do have no issues whatsoever in terms of uh, drinking some muddy water. Fluid is fluid. He's now safe in the knowledge that his dacre is stashed probably about seven or eight metres above the ground. There's no way any hyena is going to get up there, so he can afford to leave it, uh, disappear for a bit, go and have a drink, have a nice peaceful snooze somewhere, and then he'll pop back when he's hungry again. But I think he's just got a little bit of youthful exuberance this morning. I think he really wants to lie down and just chill, but he's being distracted by too many things, hyenas. Alarm calls for another predator somewhere in this area. There's impalas around. Uh, sorry, Jordan, I think was the name Sparrow there, as in the bird, I hope so, or Captain Jack. Starra or Sparrow? Sorry, uh, the comms are a little bit, we're breaking up a little bit. Uh, Sparrow, Starra, um, my apologies if we haven't quite got your name right, but thank you for the question. But yes, a leopard pretty much learns by trial and error. Obviously there'll be some sort of genetic, uh, genetic inbuilt knowledge of what's doable. Um, but so there's not a great deal of teaching done by a leopardess for her cubs. They're often left alone for periods of time and they have to kind of figure it out for themselves. I remember we had a, a young male when I was at Sabi Sabi, who uh, we called Salati, uh, and I saw him stalking herds of elephants, uh, stalking herds of buffalo, even stalking hyenas. Normally you have the hyenas following leopards, but in this case he used to follow hyenas around, but he was just sort of honing his skills and practicing and learning what's doable. They'll chase squirrels around and chase lizards. I shall try and get out of the shot. I'm sure you'd much rather see my rips than my fat head in the way. But yeah, so not a great deal of sort of parental care in terms of teaching from leopardesses. Uh, it is, independence is sort of inbuilt in their genetics and so they are left alone for long periods of time and they will explore their boundaries themselves. But they'll always come back to where mum left them because they know that if they want food, mum will get something and then return and take them to the kill. Okay, it seems that Rips is on the move, so we're going to try and keep up with him, see what he's up to. We're not really doing too much today. I hope Ben is able to actually keep up with um, Marie's because it's not 
not easy, not with the vegetation currently. So we're looking for anything really. I haven't, I haven't really spent much time with the impala lambs this year, so I wouldn't mind having a look at them. <gasps> or baby wildebeest, wildebeest calves. Oh, can you see that butterfly? I don't know if the car is going to come, if we're going to have a look now. It looks like, uh, stay there, don't be naughty, there we go. It's quite a big one, it looks like a sulfur tip, one of the, um, it's, it's gone, yeah, there we go. Luckily it stands out like a sore thumb, it's feeding on, I think on the flowers of a purple pandweed. Anyways, off it goes there. We'll try to follow it down the road a little bit, there's another view of it. Yeah, it looks like a sulfur tip um, butterfly, very pretty. I don't think I've ever seen the larvae, the caterpillars of this particular butterfly. And for those of you that do know me, as I'm very fond of caterpillars, love them. Haven't seen that many this year though, so we'll keep an eye out, especially for the big chunky ones, like from the swallowtails and from the hawk moths. They're great. They're normally um, normally quite adorable, if you will. One day I aspire to have a caterpillar rearing room in my house where I can collect eggs and photograph the entire process of them, you know, hatching and then watching them shed their skins and, you know, going through their different, well, going through the different molts and, and kind of doing that. Hmm. So that's kind of the, the goal one day. There is this book and I'm waiting for this book. I can't wait. I'll do handstands and cartwheels when it comes up, but they are, are doing exactly that for the last couple of years. I've been trying to uh, get, uh, to identify the larval stages of butterflies and moths and actually document them because uh, no one really has a good photographic um, copy of them. So I can't wait. Okay, so we've been navigating now. I thought I was lost for a second, but I'm, I'm not. I've been trying to get to Bufflesock Dam, and we've finally got here. Woohoo! So we'll have a look and see what's happening this side. It's nice to see that the dams have got quite a bit of water in, though. I'm just going to scan quickly to see what's around. Maybe something's hiding under a bush. And the problem with me is the reason why I don't find a lot of animals is not for the lack of trying, it's because I talk too much and then I stare at the camera and I drive straight past animals. This happens to me all the time. So I've, I've gone on a lot of game drives now on my own because I do live on a game reserve and it's amazing. I see so much wildlife all the time because I'm not talking, I'm just, just, you know, doing my thing, driving along. Wow. Here's a spectacular sight. Two Egyptian geese. Yo, how's that for a Saturday morning? Lucky us. They're even complaining a little bit. Yes. Which phone? Oh, in the water. I don't know. Some kind of algae. Is that a is that a terrapin moving with foam on its? Body. Sorry, we're distracted now from the... Look at that. Because surely the wind is not blowing that around. It was moving so quickly. I don't know what that is now. Now it seems to have stopped, but it literally was moving very... in a direction that was quite quick. It is a terrapin. A little one. It's got bubbles on its head. Um, so no, I'm not sure, but I mean, at this time of the year, normally with those algal blooms, they start to sort themselves out because of all the new water that is coming on in. It's typically what we see in um, in the dry seasons, but I suppose we haven't quite had much, much rain just yet. Anyways, I'm sending you across to somewhere. I'm not sure where because I am a terrible listener. Uh, as we suspected, um, Rips has decided to go for a drink. He's found himself a muddy puddle on Twin Dams Road. And he 
he's definitely getting some moisture into that body. So it is a very, very hot day, and he's got lots of dacre in that stomach and needs all the help he can get to digest. He did walk past that herd of impalas, Shema felt sorry for him again, he's had a fairly traumatic morning. Uh, all of the impalas were barking at him or snorting at him on the way past, but say uh, he was not in hunt mode at all. I think this was priority number one, finding some water. I wouldn't be surprised if he drinks here for a couple of minutes. Sometimes they can drink for very much extended periods of time. Yes, morning, Grace. It has. It's been an absolute treat. What a way to spend this. Hello, boy. What a way it has been to spend a Saturday morning. Uh, to be submerged in the life of a, of a young leopard is quite the honour. And it's quite humbling at times when you actually sort of take a step back and, and think about it. To be able to spend time with these creatures, to watch them go around their lives or go about their lives. That's the reason we do this. Try and learn from them. Try and understand them. And if nothing else, just appreciate being a part of the bigger picture and seeing something that is often not seen. It's a very clandestine creature, a leopard, as a rule. And there aren't many places in the world where you can spend quality time with a leopard like this. Most places you'll be lucky to get a fleeting glimpse as one runs across the road. We are spoilt rotten here. As Avi Sand say, the largest density of leopards in the world, around about 12 to 13 leopards per uh, 100 kilometres, uh, or sorry, per 100 hectares, I think. No, it must be kilometres. Let me get myself confused there. Either way, uh, there are a lot of leopards here, and the majority of them are very habituated, uh, thanks to tourism here. And, of course, it's those the money that comes in for tourism that allows us to keep these areas pristine and well-protected. And it's one of the things that makes Wild Earth so special here, that... You know, we can expose you as viewers to all of these incredible characters and that drives people to want to come here to see them uh, and other leopards. And that all helps to drive the, the tourism circle, which is required for conservation. I know in a perfect world, we'd love to leave them completely in peace, but such as human expansion that we sort of need to justify to an extent to keep these areas uh, relatively people free. And tourism brings in money and it creates jobs and it allows us to protect these areas, justify their protection and to maintain them. And it's an opportunity to show people the absolute beauty of nature and affect people's lives. People who come on safari remember sightings like this for the rest of their life. They tell their kids about it, they tell their grandkids about it. I would say I've taken thousands and thousands of people on safari over the years and unfortunately I can't remember the majority of them, there have been so many, but I like to think that I and the experience that the lodge they were staying at and myself and my tracker were able to offer them is something that will stay with them for the rest of their lives and that's uh, quite a humbling thought to be able to affect people in that way. I wonder how many photos there are of this leopard across the world on people's phones and uh, on people's walls. <laughs> Uh, Hannah, I know what you mean sometimes, they just look like little fluffy kitty cats, but I uh, encourage you to, or discourage you, uh, from touching any of the animals. <laughs> it may not end well, certainly after the snarl that I got from just applying some sun cream. Uh, every now and again you do get a little reminder that 
yes, he may look nice and relaxed and a fluffy kitty cat, but it's also quite capable of ripping me to shreds if he really chose to. Uh, something I'd rather avoid. And actually, if you ever get a, t a chance to touch a lion or a leopard, so as I say, please don't, uh, but perhaps you find some leopard fur, or if there is, uh, if that opportunity ever arises, I have I have felt a lion when we were doing lion darting and things, and that fur is far coarser than you think. It looks fluffy, um, but it needs to be very well maintained. It needs to be durable. It needs to be hardy. It needs to last for a long time. So it's it's actually a little bit coarser than you might think. Is that better, boy? You had some water. I'm have a chill next to your puddle. Uh, Madison, I hope he didn't hear. I think he may have heard you say that. Eh? Or <laughs> giving you the evil eye now. But maybe. A little bit of camouflage, perhaps. R rather than lipstick, let's call it uh, some sort of macho camouflage, since Marips is a young boy. <laughs> well, I suppose not that there's anything wrong with that either way. But I'm sure he'll clean himself off. Very fastidious, just like a cat at home. They're always grooming themselves. And that's uh, important to get rid of any sort of grime and gunk that's got stuck in there, particularly after feeding. Uh, remove ectoparasites. And it's also just good for the blood flow. It stimulates blood flow, keeps those muscles warm. OK, I wonder if he's going to just remain here. Nice, he's on the road for us. Uh, whether we might go back and check on his kill at some point, we will see. Hi, my name is Leslie Miller and I'm from Olympia, Washington. I'm so excited to have won a three night stay at Jackie's Tree Lodge and visit Medique Game Reserve. I started watching Wild Earth in 2019 in anticipation of my first trip to Africa in February of 2020. After that trip and through the pandemic, Wild Earth helped keep me connected to nature and Africa. I'm so happy to be able to return in person. Sign up today and you could be the one experiencing it for yourself.
I can't even see it now. Is it behind the bush? We're waiting it for it to come out in, in anticipation to see if that dung beetle is actually going to to make its move. I don't know why it wants to stop the entire time. I don't. I think at this point, honestly, I'd probably abandon my dung ball because it wasn't a particularly big one, so it's not like it's going to be using it to... It's not going to be a brood ball, so it won't lay its egg inside there, so perhaps it's going to be, uh, you know, a tasty meal. But I would have dropped it and honestly got out of there as quick as I, I can. Like I said, um, I am... And I have unfortunately been attacked by pugnacious ants on many occasions and I have lots of bites on my legs. It is not fun. And one of the biggest problems with these ants, I mean, not that the dung beetle is really going to be trampling over the ants, but with we as humans, you know, we stomp around with our big shoes and um, we accidentally step on ants. And one thing uh, that I've come to realize, I've obviously... I, I've read about it lots and, and I, I have seen it happening but, but since recently I've, when you accidentally step on an ant they release an odor, a scent that literally it's, it drives the other ants insane and they want to come and sort of like protect and they will attack anything that's around it so I've literally done a test like where I've accidentally walked over and squashed a few ants and then I'll go find a place and stand where there aren't really any ants at all and in minutes they've obviously followed that scent and then start swarming around my shoes and it's yeah it's not a fun not a fun time at all I don't know dung beetle we kind of want to go that way but no I don't know okay Anyways, I think we'll just let it do its thing. It's hiding away. Hmm. Something that we are going to do um, uh, probably a bit later this afternoon is come and spend a bit of time at this pan. But now you are going to go and have a look at something larger than a dung beetle. much, much larger than a dung beetle. I might just have a brief visual here as they are moving out into the woods. That cow seems heavily pregnant. You can even see the way she walks. They're hiding behind the bush. here now anymore. No, we're having a quite a nice morning, even though no cats or anything like that, but I'm quite happy with what we've seen. Some very good visuals and interesting conversations. I can tell you one thing. We've had this heat wave now for how long? And I think today is going to be the worst. It is going to be absolutely brutal today. I'm sitting here now and I am, I can tell you it's already very uncomfortable. So we need to have a lot of water ready today. We need to make sure that we consume enough electrolytes and water. It's going to be proper. Hi Joy. The question there is, do I think this cow will give birth soon. Yes, indeed. She's very, 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 very big. And you can see the, the, the fetus is already very far back. Uh, I would give it a back at best. I'm no, by no means a veterinarian, but in my opinion, we're looking at about a week, I would say. There's a couple of young bulls also approaching. I think after this, we need to find some shade. Just up ahead, a couple of bulls.
Hi there, Taylor. Taylor's asking if they give birth standing, sitting down. Uh, it happens while they're standing. Interesting that that's a two meter drop almost for that calf that is born. And that's arguably one of the reasons why giraffes have some of the largest babies at birth as opposed to the mother's weight. So a big cow giraffe weighs about 800 and something kilogram and a baby giraffe when they're born is about 100 kilogram. So that's a proportionally very large calf compared to the mother's weight. That's possibly because firstly it needs to be highly developed. It needs to be able to run at birth and also to compensate for that drop. Compare it to an elephant cow which weighs four tons with a 120 kilogram calf. Makes you think. Let's go over to Ben now and Juma to see what he's got. Oh, thanks, Chris. That'd be pretty amazing. Maybe we can get a giraffe birth on camera. That would be pretty special. Um, Rips has finished drinking, and he's decided that this is as good a place as any to have a bit of a rest. So we're on Twin Dams Road. Here he's found another guari bush, chilling in the shade, so safe in the knowledge his kill is safely cached away from any other pesky hyenas. Oh, having said that, apparently it's time to move on. Or are we going to have another drink? Maybe it's because I said the word hyena. I'm sure he's probably going to make his way slowly back to that marula and then find himself a nice bush and spend the rest of the day under there. I wouldn't be surprised. Okay. But there's one way to find out. So what a treat to spend the entire morning with Rips. I'm almost beginning to feel a bit guilty. We've been with him for so long. See, normally in the lodge industry, you know, we, we normally sort of, because there's lots of vehicles and lots of guests that want to come and see these animals, uh, we normally sort of limit any one vehicle's sighting to about sort of 10 or 15 minutes for the sake of fairness, if it's a busy sighting. Uh, but we have a little bit more freedom here at Wild Earth and on Juma. No, we're not going to go back to our spot. What are you going to do? Oops. You're going to head down into the Maluati. I think if Rips, if he starts going off road in here, this is quite a thick block. And if he goes down into that drainage line, I'm not going to follow him here. There's a little bit of tamboity thicket. And if he goes over the edge there, as you can see, I'm going to leave him in peace. I think that might be his way of saying, you know what? I've given you an awesome show this morning. And I want a little bit of privacy. And I think it's only right for us to do that. I can't follow him through there anyway. He's going into a Tambuti thicket. Tambuti is a protected tree here, uh, so we don't want to cause unnecessary damage. I think he's going to find himself a nice shady spot down there. You can just see a tail flicking through the leaves, and that's about it. Let's see if I back up a touch, we might still be able to see him there. Well, he's coming this way. He's still got him there, and oh, there he goes. We're debating what this road might actually be called because I can't remember. I want to say it's Gauri Cutline. Igor's not convinced. Anyways, I think it is, and we will confirm it. And, uh, yeah, anyways, it goes towards Voyotender Dam. But I can't remember, because the next road we're going to get is Central. Anyways, probably should look at a map just to familiarise myself with all the names of the roads again. I'm just checking all the water holes just to make sure 
There's no real fresh evidence of elephants, some from the rain, but just a few bulls here and there, but we haven't actually seen an elephant this morning. So we'll give them the benefit of the doubt. But when I arrived yesterday afternoon, I saw a group of these elephant bulls, so I might head this afternoon but towards the gate and then have a look and see uh, maybe they're around that side. Oh. It's now really starting to get warm. We did see, oh, you know what I didn't tell you? Oh, goodness, I don't know. The tire rods on this car, kind of just as a mind of it, oh, all of a sudden it just goes mm, that way. And then sometimes we go this way. Um, so I should probably keep both hands on the steering wheel, at least one of them. Um, we saw the tiniest little uh, leopard tortoise. It was probably only about like that big, but it was moving so quickly, as you can imagine, when you're that small, quite vulnerable to be out in the open. So best to just uh, trot on off into the um, long grass, and that's exactly what it did. It moved with serious haste. So sadly, we weren't able to show you that. But after the big rain that we recently had, I think we're going to have a bug explosion again. So I'm going to keep my eyes out for more caterpillars, for uh, any bugs really. So what I'll probably start doing from tomorrow is like getting out the car, just walking like a little circle and just seeing what I can find. It's quite difficult to spot insects when you're in a moving vehicle. Not great, but we try. Right. What do you think we're going to find at Boyotella Dam? I have no idea. I've had some great sightings at that dam though. I remember once on Bushwalk we found a baboon spider uh, in her little tunnel that goes into the ground and she had little babies on the outside, little spiderlings. Those were cute. Because seeing as I'm talking about arthropods, you're probably going, oh my gosh, you've had crazy lion sightings with buffalo that side. But we're not talking about the, the big the big animals today. Just really focusing on the little ones. Have you guys been seeing many um, chameleons? Chameleons. Chameleon? Yeah, cool. Nice. Definitely going to look for chameleons this afternoon, that's for sure. Haven't seen them for a while. I've been looking, but I don't know. Where I live, there don't seem to be that many. I've only seen just a handful, but I always remember like Juma, man, we had the best chameleon competitions here. And then when I did a safari uh, last year, I think it was last year, we um, went down on towards Buffalo's Hook and there's a section that was kind of just coming out of dry season where it's a big, massive sodic area and there's just these big quarry trees. And I kid you not, I think after the eighth chameleon, we stopped counting. They were just everywhere in that section, which was awesome. But I'm sure, as you know, with chameleons and that type of thing, there's not many trees that hold their leaves, but quarry bushes definitely do. It's a great place to hide during the, the dry months. I promise, it might look like I'm like I'm intentionally driving like this, but it's not. It's, it's the car. Rusty. It's, I don't know what's wrong. I mean, like this, the, yeah. We need to do some tightening on certain things and I think some steering arms or the tire rods might be slightly bent. So that's why I'm playing with the steering wheel so much. La la la. I do miss driving these short wheelbase um, vehicles though. They really do make a difference. When you've got to drive a long wheelbase vehicle in the bush. And then I was spoiled because obviously I drove these cars for such a long time. It's like, you know, trying to turn the Titanic. Whee! go through here. No, you're going to fly. I was going to show you a dove, but it flew away. It's fine. What do we have at the dam? Hmm. Lots of blacksmith lap wings. What a surprise. Shoo. Look at these big terrapins. They're huge. Look like they're training for the Olympics, they're swimming so quickly. But well, there's a 
whole host of life around the water's edge. So I think what we'll be doing is fix, um, changing our focus onto dragonflies and more terrapins and I suppose the freshwater life and see what's happening around there. Let's go back across to, to Ben and see how he is surviving the heat of the morning. Yes, well, we've left Maribsium, went down into the Malwati, and I think so. it wasn't really worth trying to pick a path through there and causing unnecessary damage. And we've just come up to Gary Dam um, and found five ground hornbills. We were seeing a group of four a little while ago, and then I saw a group of three about two weeks ago, and they seem to have uh, divided again, um, and we've ended up with five here. There's two or three moving that way, and there's one in the tree right above the dam cam. And they seem sort of slowly making their way south away from the dam cam now, but obviously on the hunt for anything in the grass there, be it chameleons and beetles. Oh, there comes the one who got left. But, oh no, here comes the one out of the tree coming in for landing. Realise he's getting left behind. Of course, they'll take uh, other small birds. If they find any chicks, that would be a good meal. Even tortoises with that heavy beak. They will smash through the carapace of a tortoise and gorge themselves on that. Oh, got something there, just tossed it into its mouth. <clears throat> what a cracking morning. We decided to leave Marips, drive around the corner and bump into five ground hornbills. Well, these are all adults. Let's take about seven years, very similar to the eagles, uh, to develop full, I wouldn't say plumage, but that very obvious red um, sort of skin around the face shows it's an adult. The juveniles, for the first sort of five years of their life or so, have a more of a yellowish tinged um, skin around the face there. I'm not Uh, morning, Jerry. Um, I would love to tell you we know where a nest is, but I'm unaware of any ground hornbill nests here. But we do, we are seeing them more regularly, um, but we never sort of see them going to a particular spot. But they generally will nest in natural cavities of big trees. Obviously, it needs to be a big natural cavity to squeeze one of these great big birds in there. Uh, it would be lovely if we were to have a nest somewhere on here, and it will probably be quite the focus of conservation work as well because of their sort of pretty much critically endangered status these days. Uh, if we did have a nest, we would certainly be following their lives very, very closely. Uh, but say there are no youngsters with this group, so whether they are, well, so it's very difficult to know at what point they changed, uh, or the, if some of those are some younger ones. Oh, sorry, Eddie, I thought they'd all disappear, they didn't they? You still had one in frame there. Uh, because it's sort of, there's a long gap, sort of potentially between five to seven years. <laughs> Christmas turkey running up the road. Uh, five to seven years between clutches because of the long time it takes for maturity to be reached. Uh, and that is one of the reasons that they are in so much trouble in terms of population numbers. You imagine if you've got to invest five years into raising what is only going to be one chick. Uh, and then something happens after four years, you have to start all over again, and it's a slow process. But quarantine's a perfect hunting area for them, it's nice and open. You don't normally find them in sort of really thick wooded areas. They like this sort of more... So as with most birds of prey, because I would consider well, still a bird of prey, it's not a raptor, obviously, but it follows the same sort of... Um, pathway as the other eagles and hawks and things in terms of their uh, nest, lay nest laying, nest building or egg laying uh, and incubation periods and things and then so they will have two eggs very much like an eagle and the second egg is more of an insurance policy and should that first egg hatch uh, that chick will get all the attention and the second one will uh, pretty much unfortunately not make it because it's there in case something happens to the first one so only one chick to get to adulthood every five to seven years is a 
big gap uh, and a big chance for something to go wrong. All right, it looks like those uh, hornbills have disappeared off into the bushes now. They may pop out on quarantine again, but I'm just going to go and have a look on team. Maybe we can find our territorial wildebeest. And I'd still like to know what those other impala were snorting at whilst we were with Marips. It sounded like it was coming from the Twin Dams area, um, but I did have a quick look on the road whilst we were with Marips, and I didn't see any other tracks, but the road is still quite hard after the rain and needs to be broken up a little bit more. Let's see what we can find up on quarantine. On the twelve days of Christmas, wild earth has planned to see twelve hippos hiding, eleven weavers weaving, ten leopards leaping, nine ostrich dancing, eight liner lying, seven Ellie swimming, six cheetah chasing, five buffalo. Four calling cubs, three giraffes, two crocodiles, and a naughty vervet monkey. All right, well, all the impalas in the world apparently have now clustered onto quarantine, all of them picking little pockets of shade. It is a fairly abrasive African sun now, but there must be well over 100 impalas in view, which is strange because I drove over quarantine this morning on our way down to Maritz and didn't see, a, well, I'd say we didn't see a single impala. It was actually quite heart-wrenching. There was one little impala lamb on its own, sort of meowing for mum. Oh, there's some babies skipping. <laughs> um, sort of meowing, looking for its mother, and there were no other impalas to be seen. So I thought I'd come up and see if we could find <clears throat> that youngster and see whether it has found mum, but I'm sure it has. There's enough here that will be joined up with one of these little creches. Look at him go. It's got the zoomies. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha. 
<laughs> having lots of fun this morning. They don't care about the heat. You can probably hear our wildebeest mm. gnooing in the background as well. There's that stotting that we often talk about with impalas, like that rocking horse motion, kicking the back legs out. Often what they do when they're being chased by a predator, and potentially releasing pheromones into the air from those metatarsal glands. <laughs> These youngsters are having a blast. How cute. But all very, very important, of course, to get those muscles nice and strong. And it's all play, but one day it will be serious. And this, these play sessions will be invaluable. It's the adults sort of standing around in the shade and going, crazy kids. Yeah, look at that, how beautiful is that? <laughs> they're running laps of quarantine they're covering a big distance they're going to get very very hot be careful guys and back again I wonder if they're playing some sort of game of it or tag or chase or if it's a race who knows but they seem to be having a whale of a time I hope you all like me are just watching this with a great big grin on your face. How cute. <laughs> Marie, I think you're right. I think coffee and uh, some other things perhaps as well. Loads and loads of energy. Now I felt for Taylor this morning. I did offer her coffee this morning, but she, she claimed she was going to go without this morning. But yes, perhaps the Impalas have raided the camp whilst we've been away. <laughs> what a beautiful sighting. It's just bringing joy to my heart, as I'm sure it is all of you. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to talk over the top of this because we are almost out of time. We're down to the last minute or so, but it's been an incredible morning, certainly for myself and Odie here. And I know great to have Taylor back and to see uh, those black dam males. And let's hope they hang around for a while. But it was an incredible sighting of the rips this morning. And I'm we'll see if we'll pick him up again this afternoon. Ground hornbills and then frolicking impala, certainly full of the joys of summer. But thank you very much for joining all of us this morning. We, of course, will be out again this afternoon for Sunset Safari. And, of course, don't forget, Escape to Nature will also be following on straight from here. So I hope you've enjoyed the morning as much as we have. It's always a pleasure, and it has been a Catterday morning to remember, certainly. So we will, well, I will see you later this afternoon from about half past three.